Hey everybody, it's Amy Berger here again, back for what I think is my fourth appearance with the Adapt Your Life and Adapt Live audience. Um, for those of you who haven't seen my previous videos, I am a low carb and ketogenic friendly nutritionist and writer, and I'm the author of the book, The Alzheimer's Antidote, which is about using a low carb or ketogenic diet to fight Alzheimer's disease, cognitive decline, and cognitive impairment. Um, today, my topic is food quality, a really important topic on, on keto that I don't think gets talked about enough. But before I get into that, I want to tell you about the Adapt Your Life event in Atlanta. Um, February 16th from 9 a.m. to 3.30. We're going to be in, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here, the Lawrenceville area. I think that's a suburb of Atlanta. We'll be at the C3 Church in Lawrenceville. So <clears throat> please check that out. Come join us. I will be speaking. Uh, Eric Westman, of course, will be speaking, Adapter Life co-founder. Um, Dr. David Jockers will be there and Dr. Jeffrey McDaniel. So, um, you know, two people that we don't really hear much from. It's always good to have new voices coming in and new people telling us about their experience, especially when they're local. So we'll see you in Lawrenceville on the 16th. And now let's get into it. Um, to me, in my opinion, the beautiful thing about keto is that it's simple. It's so simple. For most people who just want to be healthy, who want to lose some body fat, get their blood sugar down, get their insulin down, unless you're dealing with a really, really severe condition, most people don't really need to weigh and measure their food. They don't need to track the food. They don't need to have specific ratios. They, knew, they don't need to calculate grams of everything. Um, you don't need a PhD in calculus to be successful on a low carb or ketogenic diet. You don't need 57 apps. You don't need a watch and a monitor and this and that. You don't need to turn yourself into a cyborg. You just need to change the food you're eating. Um, and I don't know how to even say this. Unfortunately, it, it unfortunately may not be the right word, but unfortunately, some ki kinds of obsession and, and a religious type of purity thinking about food quality and food sourcing and the provenance of food has like trickled down into the keto world and it's starting to take away from the main message of keto. And to me, the main message of keto, the beauty, the simplicity of keto is that there's really only one thing you have to do, right? Do we, do we see this? Rule one of keto, don't eat sugar and starch. And what else do we have? Rules two through 99, see rule one. Literally, this is the only thing you have to do to be successful on keto, period. Everything else is gravy, everything else is a bonus. Now, before anyone throws me out of here or kicks me out of the keto club, let me specify. It's not that everything else is unimportant. It's not that food quality is unimportant. It's not that your macros don't matter at all or that nothing else matters except getting rid of sugar and starch. But for the majority of people, the majority of benefits of the low carb way of eating come from exactly that, the low carb. Um, I actually don't even love the word keto or ketogenic all that much anymore <clears throat> because it puts the emphasis on being in ketosis or chugging a lot of MCT oil or you know fasting, doing all these things to raise ketones when what most people need to focus on is keeping the carbs very low. So even the abbreviation LCHF, which we mostly know as low carb, high fat, is kind of problematic for me now because so many people are putting the emphasis on the HF, the high fat, rather than the LC, the low carb. So the doctor out of Tasmania, Gary Fetke, and I think maybe even Tim Noakes now, they like to call LCHF low carb healthy fat. And I'm on board with that, but unfortunately the low carb, high fat, you know, phrase, motto, mantra has become so widespread that everybody just knows it as high fat now. Anyway, I'm rambling. The point of that is to say that the single most important thing of the ketogenic or low carb diet is a very low carb intake. Your food quality, where you get your food from is a lesser issue. It's not unimportant. We, we, we can't disregard it, but let's talk about it. Um, there's a, kind of three different things that I have planned to talk about. 
uh, organic food, grass-fed meats and poultry and, you know, eggs from pastured hens and all that, and artificial sweeteners. And there's a lot more we could talk about. There's omega-3, omega-6, maybe Adapt Your Life will have me back someday and I can talk about that. Um, but before I even get into the details on those three things, let's be clear on one point. Keto is an equal opportunity diet. We welcome all. We don't care where you're from, what you look like, how much money you have in the bank, what God you pray to, if any. Um, we don't care where you're starting from. If you're 300 pounds, 500 pounds, 700 pounds, 100 pounds. We don't care where you're starting from. If you want to eat this way to improve your health, we welcome you and we're glad you're here. With that in mind, there is no room for elitism and self-righteousness in keto, not in my keto, not in the, com the keto community I want to be a part of. So putting an emphasis on expensive food, on all organic food, on the best quality food, the purest, most pristine food, this should not be a barrier to entry for people who can't afford it. Um, many of you watching may be blessed with, with good, secure, stable jobs, and, and you can afford very, very high quality food. Not everybody out there fits that description. Some people are going to go to the local grocery store and get whatever's on sale. And as long as those items are very low in carbohydrate, those people are going to do fine and they should never be made to feel otherwise. They shouldn't be shamed about where their food is coming from. There shouldn't be fear mongering on social media that that is leading these people to believe that they're not going to be able to accomplish their goals by eating regular food from the regular store, whether that goal is losing body fat or bringing the blood sugar down, bringing the blood pressure down, getting rid of acid reflux. We know all of these things clear up like dynamite when people get rid of sugar and starch. So I've rambled enough. Let's get on with it. Regarding organic food, the science is pretty mixed. Um, some studies say that organically produced uh, foods have slightly higher nutrient content, meaning higher amounts of vitamins and minerals. Some studies say they don't. Um, some studies say it's a wash. So it's really not known for certain whether organic food is more nutrient dense. Um, if your concern is, you know, pesticide residue and things like that, I, I, I honestly don't know what to tell you. I mean, all, all we know is that plenty of people, thousands, if not millions at this point, when we look worldwide, thousands, if not millions of people are doing ketogenic diets, doing low carb diets without organic food, eating regular food, grown conventionally, grown with pesticides, and they're doing fine. Um, they're accomplishing their goals. They're losing the weight. They're getting off the diabetes medication. All that good stuff is happening and they're not eating organic food. Um, and then the grass fed issue is, is kind of interesting. I've worked on small farms. I've worked on family farms, small operations, doing everything on pasture, everything grass-based. Um, so I absolutely understand and support and, and promote that kind of farming. But again, not everybody out there is going to be able to afford the kinds of prices that that food commands. I mean, one of the farms I worked at, this is US dollars, but the steaks, like a T-bone steak, a porterhouse, a ribeye was $20 a pound. We can't all afford that. Grass, the, the, the ground beef was $8 a pound and it was delicious grass fed, the, the most pure beef you can get, but people, not everybody can afford that. It was in a Washington DC sub suburb. People are very wealthy. Um, but some people are going to go to the store and get regular ground beef, like in those big tubes. I don't know if this is available in South Africa or the UK or Australia or wherever you're watching this, but in the U S in our supermarkets, you can buy like three pound tubes of ground beef. And they're very, very inexpensive, and it's still just beef. There's no additives, there's no starchy fillers. So it's not organic, it's not grass-fed, but it's still perfectly good. It's, it's a fabulous source of protein and fat. Um, and just to clarify, um, all beef, even in the US where we have this crazy feedlot system, all beef is started on grass. It's all raised on pasture for most of its life. The cattle are only moved to a feedlot for, for, for the last few months where they need to fatten up quickly. Um, and guess what? 
They fatten up beef quickly on grain, just like they do humans. If lard and beef tallow and oil was so fattening, they would feed, fill the troughs in those feedlots with fat, wouldn't they? They'd load them with lard, they'd load them with butter, but they don't. They load them with corn, they load them with soy, they load them with grain. That's just, that's just an FYI. Um, so to me, so, so the grass fed issue is mainly that, um, Studies have shown that grass-fed beef is actually higher in certain nutrients, not many, but a little bit, and it's higher in two special kinds of fats, one called CLA, conjugated linoleic acid, and it's higher in omega-3 fats. Now, the thing is, it's not that much higher. You know, feedlot beef will still have those fats. The grass-finished beef will just have a little more. Um, and that small difference for people on a budget may not be enough to, to warrant paying so much more for it. Um, to me personally, especially having worked on these farms, the reason to buy uh, grass-fed meats, or I should say grass-finished, like I said, all meat is grass-fed at one point, grass-finished meats or, or chicken raised on pasture or eggs from pastured hens, you know, hens that are truly free-roaming, free-ranging, um, you know, dairy from, from cattle that are, that are solely raised on pasture, all that stuff. The reason to do that is mostly because you should do it locally. Even more than the grass-fed to me and, and grass-finished is buying locally because you can literally hand your money to the people involved in the day-to-day -day production of that food. The people that fed the animals, the people that moved the fences to move those animals to a new patch of pasture every day. Um, the people who drove the truck to the farmer's market that you're buying it at. Um, you can keep your food dollars in your local economy. You can support the people growing it right in your community rather than giving it to a corporation or sending your money to somebody, someone that grew or produced your food 5,000 or 8,000 miles away on a different continent entirely. If you're concerned about food miles, the environmental implications of where your food comes from, to me, those are more valid reasons for buying food of that nature versus the the small difference in the nutrient content um and and i i should rephrase that every reason is valid whatever you feel you need to do do it but i just don't want anyone to falsely you know lead new people in this movement to thinking that they have to eat that kind of food or they're not going to be successful if they don't um so the artificial sweetener issue oh, Boy, is that a contentious one, huh? Where do I even start? Just like the organic issue, um, scientific studies on artificial sweeteners are very, very mixed. It's kind of horrifying what they do to some of the rodents involved in the studies. The studies are rarely done on humans. They're done on rodents, and these rodents are given massive, massive quantities of this stuff. This stuff, whether it's aspartame or saccharin or sucralose or whatever. Um, it, you know, quantities that, that, that a human being would never ingest in, in like a lifetime, practically. And it's, I'm losing my train of thought. I hate that. Let me consult the notes here. I mean, that, that kind of quantity of anything could be deadly, right? Water is deadly in that quantity. Oxygen is deadly in that quantity. Every year, at least in the U.S., we have a news story coming out about some stupid university fraternity hazing stunt where, you know, the fraternity brothers encourage some pledge to guzzle, guzzle water until he literally dies from water intoxication. So Pretty much the, the poison is in the dose, right? Anything can be deadly taken too much, you know, vitamin A, vita anything, vitamins and minerals can have the same thing. They can have adverse effects just because a little is good doesn't mean more is better. And with artificial sweeteners, just because a lifetime's worth injected into you as a rat is harmful doesn't mean one pack of Splenda in your morning coffee is gonna kill you. Um, and I, I, I emphasize the studies are mixed, but um, the, thing, the thing is, 
if if you prefer to avoid artificial sweeteners avoid them i have nothing against people avoiding them but we cannot deny the many many people who include liberal amounts of this stuff in their diets and they're doing fine like i said whether it's aspartame or sucralose or saccharin or stevia some people think that stevia is natural because it does come from a plant but when you look at stevia it's a white powdered highly refined product just like everything else right you can get powdered just desiccated green stevia leaves but most of us aren't consuming it in that fashion whatever your chosen artificial sweetener is erythritol xylitol again maybe those are natural because they're sugar alcohols but the way they're processed into this white powder not exactly the way it occurs in nature so i consider all of those to be artificial sweeteners um if including those types of sweeteners in your diet means the difference between you being able to stick with keto or low carb long term versus not then have them have them especially when you're new get yourself over the hump i mean ideally in an ideal world everybody me included would learn to entirely break ourselves of the desire for that sweet taste right ideally i would take my coffee black or just with some cream ideally i would never want some sugar-free raspberry syrup in it or i would never want you know an almond flour cookie or a chocolate cake made with erythritol uh, but i'm not there yet and i don't plan to ever get there um and I don't think anyone's a bad person. I don't think anyone's a failure if they still enjoy something sweet. In the context of a ketogenic or low carb diet, it is far better to have the fake sweetener than the real thing. If you have type two diabetes, if you have chronically high insulin, if you are dealing with obesity, um, if you have any of these metabolic problems dealing, you know, stemming from, from chronically high insulin or chronically high blood sugar, you are much better off switching to artificial sweeteners than continuing to use the real thing. Um, you know, diet soda is better than regular soda. A pack of sweet and low or saccharin or whatever is available in your country is better than lots of sugar in your coffee. You know, the, the, the sugar-free flavored syrups that you can put in coffee, you can put them in yogurt, the fruit flavors work really good in yogurt. Um, those are better than those non-dairy flavored creamers that you see. I, again, I, I'm not sure what's available overseas. I know Adapter Life has a, a widely international audience. In the US, we have all these like crazy creamers with these flavors you could not even imagine. I mean, the, the most wonderful sounding flavors, but they have about five to six grams of sugar per tablespoon, one tablespoon. And you all know we're all using way more than one tablespoon of that in a cup of coffee. So by the time your coffee's done, you've had 10 or 15 grams of sugar, not to mention whatever else somebody might be eating. So I just really, the artificial sweeteners don't scare me. I don't live on them, but I don't live on them because I don't have a huge desire for something sweet. Um, I have one pack of, of sweetener in my coffee and I get on with my day. Um, where, where I think the gray area with the sweeteners is, is that if having the, even the, the sensation of sweetness or the taste of sweetness spurs you on to have more and more hunger and more and more cravings for other sweet things, you might be better off eliminating it entirely versus if you have something fake sweet you know with with artificial sweetener or sugar alcohol and you love it it's delicious and you move on and you you aren't you know driven to consume more and more and more then it's it's perfect for the ketogenic diet because it allows you to enjoy sweet things and to make maybe ketogenic versions of some of your previous favorites and stay on plan and be true to the diet and get the results you want um and and you can and and again like like you know eric westman who who is on the these adapt videos all the time he has patients all the time all the other low carbon keto doctors we know have patients all the time that eat all of this stuff on a regular basis and they're doing great um can we say that maybe 20 or 30 years down the line something might not develop i don't know Honestly, no, I can't promise you that. I can't promise that somebody who looks great and feels great and has lost 100 pounds and is doing fabulously might not develop some problem down the line. Maybe we don't know. But in the here and now, 
if you are dealing with type 2 diabetes or you have obesity or you have some other very serious medical issue that needs to be corrected in the here and now, your problem right now is robbing you of quality of life, <clears throat> it's robbing you of mobility, it's robbing you of enjoyment of everything because you're in chronic pain or something, deal with the here and now because we don't know what's going to happen 30 or 40 years down the line but we know that right now you're in a crisis and we can turn this crisis around very quickly and very easily very easily with a low carb or ketogenic diet um I'm not going to harp on it anymore. Like I said, there, there's many of uh, other issues I could talk about with regard to the food quality, um, but that's, that's the starting point. If you're new to this, get the sugar out of your diet, get the starch out of your diet, worry about everything else later. And as for the developing something way down the line, I've been using artificial sweeteners for over 18 years, um, maybe more, and I'm still here. I'm still alive as far as I can tell. Yeah, pulse, pulse is still registering, so it hasn't killed me yet. I mean, maybe tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> um, thanks for watching, and uh, thank you to Adapt Your Life, and um, I will see you in Lawrenceville, Georgia on February 16th. Take care. Oh, don't forget, subscribe to this channel. Please subscribe to the Adapt Your Life channel. Feel free to share these videos if you enjoy them, and um, I've started my own YouTube channel recently. It's Tuit it Nutrition, T-U-I-T Nutrition. You can search for that. Please subscribe to that. I hope to um, share similar information to what I've shared here, how to do keto simply and sanely and without going broke and making yourself crazy in the process. Um, my blog is tuitnutrition.com, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.